This week on The Signal, Please stand together in Dalhousie students hold a vigil for victims of the Quebec shootings. The Girl Guide movement takes on a new challenge, encouraging mental health. And The Signal takes you on a tour of HMCS Summerside. Hi, I'm Jessica Hurdle. And I'm Margaret Zuo. Welcome to this week's edition of The Signal. From the School of Journalism at the University of King's College, we're here at the Halifax Central Library. In our top story, people across the country turned out to support the Muslim community. Six people were shot and killed at the Quebec City Mosque this week. Here in Halifax, Rachel Collier went to a vigil at Dalhousie. I struggle externally, internally. Late Monday afternoon, more than 200 people came to the Dalhousie Quad. We will not let our differences define us, that when we need each other, we can gather just like this today and stand with one another together, holding each other. I was really upset. Um, I was about to go to bed last night um, and I just saw the notification and my first reaction was like, oh no, it's happening in Canada as well. The past few days we've all been thinking, well, that's happening in the U.S. and, you know, we're glad we're here and we're not in the U.S. Um, and it's scary, it's scary to think that it can happen here. And students in general need to realize that Islamophobia is a real, real issue on our campus. And, and I think it's time that people come and stand in solidarity with our Muslim brothers and sisters and be like, you know, we're here for you. Still, I look at your people so harmlessly and you look at mine so harmfully. I'm begging and pleading you, please come together in solidarity. Although whatever happened is very sad and makes me feel really terrified, but at the same time I get a lot of hope that I can always find a lot of good people around me. I am here for you. For The Signal, I'm Rachel Collier. A novel that came out almost 70 years ago is at the top of Amazon's bestseller list. Local bookstores are seeing a big demand as well. 1984 tells the story of a dark future and an all-powerful government. Delaney McKay reports. If you're looking for Orwell's novel at the King's Bookstore, you won't have any luck. Uh, I've only got one copy right now. Other books by Orwell as well are selling extremely well. I've been trying to reorder some of them, and even the publishers are running out of stocks. So we're waiting on them to get it, to then get it to us, which is kind of unheard of lately. I'd like to have as many of the kind of classic books uh, that people are looking for, but I've just placed an order for about 10 to 12. Another shop in town is noticing a sudden demand for all of Orwell's work. It's the kind of book that becomes a bestseller or sells more frequently, um, it like ebbs and flows. It will have a re resurgence because it's that type of book and uh, I think it will continue to be a bestseller because it kind of prompted people to think subversively about their own governments. Uh, well we just downloaded 1984 onto Kindle yesterday and we started rereading that. Read it a long time ago in the 70s when 1984 seemed a long time in the future. Um, but we thought, given current circumstances, it would be interesting to refresh our memories. Trevor Ross teaches a propaganda course at Dalhousie. He says Orwell's novel becomes a bestseller, often in times of crisis. And now we've got pundits on the air using lines from that novel about how Trump is trying to convince us that 2 plus 2 equals 5. And one of the reasons why we turn to things like 1984 is to work through fear almost. If you want a copy, the Halifax Public Library says you'll have to wait. All of their nine hard copies are already out. 44 people are waiting to view, listen, or read 1984. For The Signal, I'm Delaney McKay. This is Africa Heritage Month. This year, it focuses on legacy, leadership, and mentorship. The month kicked off with an opening ceremony at the North End Library. Jessica was there. The special event started with a traditional African libation ceremony. Liquid is poured as an offering of respect and honor to ancestors. And the importance is that anybody that's in the crowd, especially our young African Nova Scotian youth, for them to realize that the ancestors have set the stage for us and that we stand on their shoulders. Nova Scotia has celebrated African Heritage Month for 33 years. This year's theme is passing the torch. You don't keep your knowledge to yourself. It's important that you share that to the next generation for a couple of reasons. One, so that they possibly don't make the mistakes that you made, and so that they know they are always walking on the backs of those who went before them. 
I did. Um, so Tracy Jones, uh, Craig Smith, Cecil Wright. Marcus James lists his mentors, and now he is one too. He is part of Man Up, a group that brings black men of all ages together to end violence in the community. To be willing to take that torch, right? If somebody's passing it to you, you need to step up to the plate and take it and run with that, right? And that's all I did. You know, I just continue what was already started here. The theme of community, family, and mentorship will come up again at African History Month events over the next four weeks. For The Signal, I'm Jessica Hurdle. The Girl Guides are teaching young girls about mental health. And the girls may not be the only ones learning about the Mighty Minds Challenge. Rachel Collier has more. At the start of their brownie meeting, this group of six to seven-year-olds listed the tips and tricks they know to stay healthy. Eating fresh food and getting exercise were common ideas. This week, the Brownies took some time to learn more about mental health. 50% of mental health disorders develop by the age of 14. If it starts young, then it's normalized and it's part of everyday life, just as our physical health is part of everyday life. The Brownies learned about mental health by participating in Girl Guides of Canada's Mighty Minds Challenge. The new program launched nationwide last week with activities tailored to girls aged 5 to 17. Um, I learned that some people have different mental health. These brownies learn general mental health concepts, like the difference between mental health and mental illness. They practice being mindful of each other and their surroundings. Our eyes closed and count to seven. Five. Six. Seven. And how language might affect their friends' mental health. Smallwood wishes people had talked more about mental health when she was growing up. It wasn't a conversation I had growing up. Um, I live with what's called a body-focused repetitive behavior, uh, which is associated with OCD. Um, and it was not something that I talked about growing up with my family. It wasn't talked about in school. I grew up in girl guiding as well, and it certainly wasn't part of that. Um, it wasn't until I got to university that it became part of the conversation. Some parents say girl guide groups are special environments for kids to learn about mental health. I think Brownies is an excellent venue because it's non-judgmental. I mean, it's school still has the concept of being evaluated um, uh, and having a teacher, whereas Brownies is more, more of a community, more of a group where they're all equals. Um, it's girls only, which I have to say at this age can make a difference to, to some of the kids in terms of being open, being able to open up. And we learn from those who come after us, so if our young are talking about mental health, I think it would be easier for us as adults who haven't grown up talking about it to talk about it. Okay, so does everyone feel like they do have someone they can talk to if they need to? For The Signal, I'm Rachel Collier. Coming up after the break, leftovers, only better. Syrian refugees in Halifax start a new business. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Signal. We're at the Central Library in Halifax. It's been a year since the first wave of Syrian refugees came to Canada. Now, some of them are starting their new business. Alex Rose has the story of a group here in town. Early every Saturday morning, the Halifax Seaport Market comes to life. This booth has been open for two weeks. Peace of the East is a new company run by Syrian refugees. The three friends use leftovers from the Parker Street Food Bank that would otherwise be thrown out. Yeah, very good and help the people in Parker Street. Very, I am happy, very help for him. Rafat Harb has been in Halifax for just 11 months and volunteering at the food bank for six. They were volunteering at the food bank and they decided that they want to do something using their skill sets uh, at the kitchen to just make some jams, get creative, create shortbread products and stuff like that. The refugees are making traditional Arabic foods as well as croutons. This is Jim Apple. Good morning. Apple Jim. How are you? This, this is my logo for the business. And part of the business plan is to be environmentally friendly. Food that is upcycled is food that doesn't go to waste. Allah is another founder. 
He is very happy with the response so far. I love uh, any, anything here, uh, community. Thank you, everybody here. Yeah, for help me for opening uh, Peace of the East. Welcoming scenes like this one were common at the stall all day long. If this keeps up, the friends hope to make a living off their new business. For The Signal, I'm Alex Rose. From upcycling food to upcycling clothes, Margaret went to a workshop that could give you some tips and tricks. Here's what she found. These people want to turn old clothes to trendy pieces. A little of time and creativity will make it happen. So you have clothes that you don't like and you can like make them into something else or if you have clothes that you do like and you want to make them like kind of DIY. This used to be a dress but then turned into a scarf. So if there's any like clothes that you don't want you can just turn them into a scarf or something like that and it's pretty cool. Laura Walton, who has her own YouTube channel named Cinderella Soul, some video has more than 15,000 views. Now she's here to teach people how to recycle and upcycle their old fashion clothes and be more in fashion. Perfect. With scissors and needles, a few steps make old clothes a big difference. Like I think it's fun to do something with your hands. Like it's always fun to be kind of crafty. And I yeah, think people really it, like having control over what they wear. So instead of having to buy something out of a store and wear that, to be able to put your own personal spin on it and have it reflect your personality, um, I think that makes people feel really good. Like they can really express themselves in what they're wearing. And this is not only about fashion and style, but the environment as well. In protecting the environment and not being wasteful, using everything, um, I think there is a trend of wanting to be a little bit more careful with our resources and upcycling is one way to do it. So instead of throwing something out, you might make it into something new. For The Signal, I'm Margaret Zuo. Music of the Renaissance filled the Maritime Conservatory on Sunday night. Luke McDonald checked it out. Madrigal style music may be about 500 years old, but Halifax's Helios Vocal Ensemble is doing their part to keep this type of music alive and relevant in Halifax's classical music community. Madrigals originated in the 1520s. They are sung in a polyphonic style, meaning many voices at once. As Elizabeth Stones explains, the language found in them is the key to their magic. Um, the language. Uh, it, it brings um, different lines out in neat ways and, and really presents uh, a tapestry of, of music for, for people to enjoy. <laughs> Rehearsals may be important, but it's the show that counts. Helios packed the concert hall and brought the crowd to their feet at the end of their show, the Madrigal Mystery Tour. Andrew Pickett explains the importance of putting on a good show. So we had people come up to us after and say, so, is your next CD going to be Madrigals? Because we think your next CD should be Madrigals and we want you to do a CD. Uh, it's fantastic to get feedback like that, uh, not only because we know that if we do a CD like that, then they're going to buy it, but, you know, they might even help back it. That's... That's a big deal. The audience shares in the group's love of madrigals. If I saw more concerts like this, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely become a madrigal buff. As well. It's always exciting uh, and a wonderful uh, form of music. There's a very large early music community here. I'm, I'm proud of it. For The Signal, I'm Luke McDonald. A local group wants to get people thinking about Nova Scotia's part in the labor movement. As Victoria Walton reports, they are studying with film. Mayworks Halifax presented nine short films Monday at the Bus Stop Theatre. They were from Armenia, Switzerland, Serbia and further, like Brazilian film The Migrants. Despite the film's diversity, they all had a common theme. It's a great um, learning experience, I find, to, to, to see the lessons and victories of workers uh, abroad, uh, and it better prepares us, I think, to, um, 
to stand up for our own rights here uh, in Canada. The shorts are part of the Canadian Labour International Film Festival public sector workers and private sector workers and we're seeing harsh struggles here in Nova Scotia in both those areas with long stretches of attacks against public sector workers from the uh, from the current Liberal government. The province has had its own labour struggles this year including the year-long Chronicle Herald strike and ongoing teachers work to rule. The film festival is a way of using art to communicate the serious struggles of workers worldwide. The stakes might be higher for people in different parts of the world, but that doesn't mean that it's not a very like uh, true struggle for people here. Mayworks also debuted what they call social justice trading cards. Just like retro baseball cards, but all ten characters are important to Nova Scotia's history, like Muriel Duckworth and J.V. McLaughlin. But they serve kind of as a stepping stone in learning and rediscovering this part of our history and by coming together and enjoying kind of these films that we can see that we're not alone in these struggles. LaBelle also announced the plans for this May Day, or International Workers' Day. The annual May 1st march will be followed by two weeks of art and performances. For The Signal, I'm Victoria Walton. After the break, Chinese New Year dumplings and inside the Navy ship. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Signal. Two drinks is a big deal for restaurant owners in Nova Scotia, but they're not the ones drinking. As Bronwyn Mackay reports, it's all about a change in liquor regulations. Someone has just ordered a cocktail. Kaylee Burns is no stranger to cocktails, but serving only alcohol is new. Her business, El Chino Snack Bar, is technically an eating establishment, not a bar. Burns' neighborhood doesn't allow for straight-up bar licenses. Before last week, she had to turn away anyone looking for just drinks. But last week, the provincial government said places like hers can now serve up to two drinks before having to serve food. For Burns, the update makes business easier. She can draw more customers and better meet their expectations. We weren't originally allowed to serve alcohol without the purchase of food. So you would have a lot of unmet expectations by people that are in the neighborhood that are just like, listen, I'm not rowdy, I'm not crazy, like what's the harm in serving me a glass of wine just before I go home and like kick my babysitter out? And it's like, well, it's against the law, that's why. Now, patrons can sit down and enjoy a casual drink at any point in the night. It's nice to be able to explore different parts of the city and not have to go downtown and deal with a potential crowd or a taxi home. We can walk to our house from here. It just opens everything up and allows an establishment to do what they want to do. It doesn't limit their customers and doesn't limit the customers' options on where they go. The body that represents restaurants in Nova Scotia says the industry has been asking for updates to this law for years. They hope the government will continue to revise outdated industry laws. For The Signal, I'm Bronwyn Mackay. This past weekend was Lunar New Year. In China, normally it's a big occasion where families make dumplings together. In Halifax, some Chinese students had to celebrate with friends instead. Yu Zhang was there too. The Navy brought guests on board recently. The tour gave a rare point of view, to say the least. Eleanor Davidson has the story. Ships spend the majority of their life in the water, but HMCS Summerside is on the maintenance dock at CFB Halifax right now. Summerside is a coastal defense vessel, and Lieutenant Commander Paul Smith is the captain. 
He thinks these kind of public relations events are important for the Navy. Well, I think it's very important uh, as a Navy, uh, as a military, uh, to allow the civilian population to see what we do. Uh, there's no sense of, um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping it secret, and it helps to uh, build a better relationship with the community. An army runs on its stomach, and so does the Navy. Having quality food to eat is vital for good morale. Sailors love to have a snack and listen to stories with each other in the wardroom, like that time in the Caribbean. Fair enough. So they sail back over and they go to return the papers and this poor Honduran fisherman puts his hand down and exposes a solid gold Rolex. <laughs> so they say, wait a minute, something's going on here. So they come back and say, sir, we've got enough evidence, we're going to board. And they boarded and within two minutes found uh, 300 and... I want to say 370 kilograms of uh, cocaine. In, uh, the... If the kitchen is the stomach of the ship, then the bridge is the brain. It's the simple stuff that you do Everything day day. from steering the ship to making crucial decisions on the fly happens here. Sometimes it's a pretty stressful place to be, but the view can also be spectacular. We made our way down to the sleeping quarters and saw that space in the ship comes at a premium. Not only do the sailors deal with small bunks, but, as Lieutenant Commander Smith explained, oftentimes they need to learn how to lodge themselves into their bed while they sleep in stormy seas. The engineering room could be thought of as the heart of the ship, and Lieutenant Commander Smith thinks a human element of control is just as important as the instrumentation on board. The human part of it running through. Uh, they travel through the spaces so often that uh, you've got eight tickets that know the sound of the place. You know, they'll, they'll tell you what the speed is just by the vibration on the deck plates or how hard the engine's running. Oh, we just come up two knots. And you can't translate that experience into uh, uh, a piece of technology. I'd just like to add, for uh, as we start off with, anybody who really doesn't have a strong understanding of uh, the military or the Navy, um, you know, get out there, research it. It's a wonderful uh, organization uh, that is continually changing, uh, continually representing uh, Canadian uh, society. And uh, for me and several others, very exciting. So I encourage people to go out and take a look. Standing here on the dock, you can get a sense of just the size of the ship. She's up in the synchro lift now, preparing for mission to Africa in just a few weeks. For The Signal, I'm Eleanor Davidson. Jessica, that's all for this week. Thanks to the Central Library for having us. Join us again next week for another episode of The Signal. You can find us online at signalhfx.ca. For The Signal, I'm Jessica Hurdle. And I'm Margaret Zuo.